Thanks, Philippe, and thanks for the opportunity to be here in such a beautiful place. I've actually never given a talk in Paris before, and I was struck with how beautiful it is from the roof. And I've not, never had a better honor than be, to be called a geek, because that's exactly what I am. <laughs> so, um, so much of my career has been based upon the problem that if this is the size of a protein molecule, then this fuzzy ball is what it looks like in a normal optical microscope. So if we want to understand how inanimate molecules come together to create this object called the cell that can move and eat and reproduce, it's too coarse by two orders of magnitude. And so a lot of my work has been about trying to get around that problem. As Philippe said, this happened first in graduate school at Cornell and then at Bell Labs. At that time, the technique that we had developed was based on pulling optical fibers, coating the sides with opaque material, and having a little hole at the end that would be much smaller than the wavelength of light. And so this would act as a little nano flashlight that you could drive around point by point and get an image. So that's known as near field scanning optical microscopy. Um, it took a long time, but after about 10 years, I was able to get sort of world record of data storage density when we're writing bits as small as 60 nanometers, um, demonstrate absorption, refractive index, polarization contrast. And in 93, we actually did the first super resolution fluorescence imaging of cells with this method when we looked at the actin cytoskeleton. But the two um, applications that were probably most important for later on in my career was in 93, inspired very much by W.E. Mourner's demonstration of cryogenic temperatures of seeing the spectral signature of single molecules. We were the first to see at room temperature single molecules. In addition, we could find their positions down to about a 40th of the wavelength. Um, in another experiment, I teamed up with my best friend at Bell at the time, Harold Hess. And so we used his scanning tunneling microscope that operated at two degrees Kelvin and put in my near-field probe to look at uh, spectroscopy of the semiconductor structures called quantum wells, which gives rise to this laser here. And what we found is that the emission doesn't come from anywhere, but only from certain discrete spots. So you could think of those as like semiconductor molecules, for lack of a better word. And because of the thickness variations in the quantum well, they all glowed in different colors. Now these were so dense that even with our near-field probe, there might be a dozen of these guys underneath the probe, and normally they would not be resolvable. But because their spectra were so narrow, we could still isolate them and study them one at a time by looking at this third dimension, color, and then look at each guy individually. So this takes us up to 94. I had been doing that near field technique for a dozen years, and I was really, really sick of it. Um, part of it was because, A, I have a wanderlust anyway, and every seven to 10 years I hate what I've been doing. Um, part of it is because the near field technique had lots of fundamental limitations. And part of it was because, because of our successes, it got to be a very hot field. And I've seen this in science over and over again where there are these fads, you know, whether it's graphene or charge density waves or, you know, I don't know, brain initiative or connectomics or whatever the hell it is that goes through these boom-bust cycles. And near field was in one of these booms, and what happens is I think is the signal stays about the same, but the noise goes through the roof, and the SNR of the field goes to zero. And coupled with what I believed were the fundamental limitations, I got disgusted and I quit. Um, so uh, basically, I became a house husband. And, uh, but three months after, after quitting, I was pushing my daughter around in the stroller, and I realized that you could combine that single molecule experiment I had done with the quantum well experiment that Harold and I had done to come up with a different way of beating the diffraction limit. So the idea is, if you're interested in fluorescence, which is typically the most useful contrast mechanism in biology, then you're looking at discrete molecules. And the problem is, is those molecules make those fuzzy blobs that run together, and there's not much you can do with that. But if all of those molecules were optically different in some way, the obvious way is if they glowed in different colors, then you could isolate them in the higher dimensional space of wavelength. But once they were isolated, then you can do what we did in the single molecule experiment, and then fit the expected shape of the fuzzy ball to the actual shape of the fuzzy ball to find the center 
to much better precision than the width of the fuzzy ball. And so then you would have this sort of molecular resolution map of the sample. So I was really excited about that idea, and then I realized the catch. In order to make this work in biology, there might be hundreds or thousands of molecules in one tightly focused spot of light. And so you need a ridiculously good level of discrimination in that third axis to be able to see one molecule under hundreds, on top of hundreds of others. And I didn't know a good way of doing that at the time. So I published the idea, left it at that, and eventually followed my backup strategy, which was to go work for my dad who uh, was working in the machine tool business, had built a company which at this time was about $50 million in sales and a couple hundred employees. And they would make these very large machines that would be half the size of this auditorium. They were custom designed to make one part for a car, like a brake caliper, an exhaust manifold. And I found a way to collapse those machines into something the size of you know, a little Peugeot or something. But um, uh, so I spent four years developing that project, three years trying to sell it, and in the end I sold two of them. And so I realized that while I don't fit in sort of academic science very well, I'm a really horrible businessman. So, so I, I apologized to my dad for spending a million bucks of his money and basically uh, fell on my sword and quit. So that's about 2002. So um, I, I started meeting with Harold, who had also left Bell, because Bell was shrinking at that time. And we both decided that while we didn't think we'd fit in standard academic career, we both really missed the ability to do science, to follow our curiosity and work with our hands, and we wanted to find a way to do that. So um, we started going around to various places, and in a trip to Florida State University in 2005, we learned about um, a new kind of fluorescent protein that normally is non-fluorescent, but if you shine violet light on it, then you can convert it to a state where if you shine blue light on it, it will glow green. So that was called photoactivated GFP. And so as we were sitting in the airport to leave Tallahassee, it was obvious to us that this was the missing link to make that idea I had pitched 10 years earlier to work. So you turn the violet light down so low that only a few molecules at a time come on, you find their centers of emission, wait till they bleach or turn off, turn on another subset, do it again and again and again, and eventually you'll figure out the positions of all the molecules. Well, we were very excited about that, but also very scared because we figured this was so ridiculously easy, somebody had to be doing it. And we were right, there were a lot of people on our tail. So um, our problem was at this point we were both unemployed, and so we thought it would take too long to get grant money or to uh, get VC funding in order to do it. But the good news is that when I left Bell Labs, I told them to fuck you. But when Harold left Bell, he was able to take all of his equipment with him. So we were able to pull all of that out of the storage shed. And then we put in um, 25K each of our own money. And normally you do this kind of entrepreneurial thing in a garage, but Harold wasn't married, so we could do it in his living room. <laughs> so it was a lot more comfortable there. Um, and within just a couple months, we built the scope. But we still had another problem, is that we were two condensed matter physicists who knew zero biology. But I had been scheduled to give a talk at NIH, and I gave the talk, but I begged to have Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz and George Patterson, who invented that PAGFP, come to the talk. And they did, and I invited them to lunch, swore them to secrecy, and asked if they would join us on this project. And, you know, Jennifer is a very eminent cell biologist, and if she were a normal person, she would have blown us off because I would look like a crazy guy. I hadn't published a paper in 10 years. But instead, she said, fantastic, bring it by. I didn't realize that Jennifer says fantastic to everything, but Harold and I took that as a yes. So we packed up the instrument, brought it to um, her dark room, and another month later we were looking at sections through, in this case a cos 7 cell, through some lysosomes, these two big rings here. And turning on the violet light low, you just see single molecules come on and blink off. If you find the centers of emission, you start to bring, build up a higher resolution image. And after 20,000 frames, you go from this to this, or to better appreciate the resolution from that to that. So given high enough density labeling, which is a huge caveat in this business, 
you can push this to about 10 to 20 nanometer resolution versus 200 for the diffraction limit. And it's quite easy to do other than the labeling, which is the real big challenge. Um, so that was fine. Um, then in the same year, uh, by another crazy lucky set of circumstances, um, I got hired by Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and Harold and I moved there, and from 2006 to 2008, we lived in Breed Palm. Um, and so we did a number of applications, one with Jan Lippard's group at Berkeley, is we looked at chemotaxis receptors in E. coli, and we're able to show the sizes and positions of these clusters along the length of the bacterium are predictable in terms of a stochastic model of self-assembly, where the proteins diffuse randomly once they're inserted in the membrane until they stick to a cluster with a probability proportional to the size of the cluster. We were also able to show that proteins which look like they may be interacting at the diffraction limit, in this case focal adhesion proteins, which are in the points of contact of the cell to the extracellular matrix, are actually not actually co-localized, but are formed different nanoaggregates. With Bob Tejan's group at Janili, we're able to show that a certain class of genes that hugs up against this red nuclear membrane here can be silenced from gene expression because the core promoters are spatially segregated from that region near the nuclear membrane. And with Tom Blanpede's group at um, University of Maryland, we looked at live hippocampal neurons and was able to show that actin is polymerized only in certain discrete spots inside of the dendritic spines. So by 2008, I was as thoroughly sick of Palm as I had been of Nearfield in 1994 for all of the same reasons. It has a lot of fundamental limitations. And at the same time, it became an even bigger hoo-ha than, than Palm had, or than Ensom had been in 94. And so, of course, the SNR went to zero again, and I got very frustrated, and I was sick of it. And so I basically stopped doing that technique in 2008. Um, but it came back to haunt me in the form of a Nobel Prize in 2014. So it's fine to win the Nobel Prize, and I certainly believe localization has real applications to it. You've heard about some of them already. There's many, many other examples, and it definitely is a, a valuable tool. You know, whether it's a tool good enough for a Nobel Prize already, well, hell, I'm not the guy who makes those decisions. Those are subjective decisions, and everybody's got a different opinion. But for me, you know, this was a fun week, but it, it still doesn't feel real. In fact, the whole damn prize doesn't feel real. And I do my best not to think about it, because I always want to think about what I'm going to do next, not what I used to do. So, so, so oftentimes, you know, basically, Palm in a way grew out of my frustration of Nearfield, and what I do now grew out of my frustration of Palm. So, what is frustrating about super resolution? The first is that if you want to see a feature of a certain wavelength or size in the sample, if you only have molecules, say, every half period, you can likely miss it. And so to be able to see it, you need to densely decorate that structure with molecules. You can see here, if you undersample these features, you don't get the resolution you do there, even if the microscope itself intrinsically had that resolution. And it turns out that, for example, if you want 20 nanometer resolution, you have to have the ability to see one molecule on top of 500 or have 500, you know, in a diffraction-limited region. Turns out those numbers are very high compared to what biologists are accustomed to in labeling cells for fluorescence microscopy. And so the problems with getting to those labeling densities are, one, you're always tempted to overexpress the protein to have enough of it, and then that can change the physiology and the structure all by itself. Or if you use fluorescent proteins, the, the fluorescent protein itself can uh, cause uh, misaggregation and, and, and uh, so forth of the thing that you're trying to label. If you use exogenous dyes, there's tons of problems of getting those past the membrane um, and getting them with anywhere near reasonable specificity, which this is not, without getting a whole bunch of nonspecific background. And so super resolution, I think, is important for two primary reasons. One, super resolution fluorescence. One is to use the protein-specific contrast of fluorescence as a structural imaging tool, and then to do live imaging. But if you're doing structural imaging, which is probably, what, 95% of the papers on super resolution, and this isn't just Palm, this would be true of the 
stimulated mission depletion approach that Stefan Hal developed that also shared the prize, true of structured illumination, true of near field, true of any method, is that most of the time people look at chemically fixed cells. And you know at the nanoscale, their purpose is to cross-link proteins and they change the ultrastructure. So in my opinion, there haven't been enough controls to find out what the hell this is actually doing and how, whether we can really trust the result. So this conference is about seeing is believing. My, my goal here is to tell you about we have to be careful that we can believe what we see, okay, in a lot of things. Um, so the other fork in the road is um, to do live imaging, which is what everybody, that's why I did near field starting back in 82, is we wanted to create an optical microscope to be able to look at living cells with the resolution of an electron microscope. But there are a lot of problems there too. So just do this little Gedanken experiment. If I wanted to increase my resolution by only a factor of two in each of three dimensions, then my voxels are eight times smaller. And that means I have one-eighth as many molecules in there, which means to get the same signal to noise, same number of photons out, I need to either bang eight times harder, which the cell isn't going to like in a live context, or wait eight times longer for those photons to come out, in which case the cell has already moved and smeared out the feature I'm trying to see. So if you look at some of the claims in the literature for what these techniques can do, if just by that simple metric alone, you're asking for anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 times as many photons to be emitted from the sample to get the same SNR that you would get at the diffraction limit. If any of you do fluorescence microscopy, live or fixed, you will know it is damn difficult to get 1,000 images of your cell before it is completely bleached or killed if it were in a live context. The other problem is, is that um, localization requires a kilowatt to 10 kilowatts per square centimeter. STAD, which is that other method I mentioned, basically first excites molecules in the fraction limited spot, then brings a beam that has a node in the center of it, which by stimulated emission forces all of them back to the ground state except a little pool in the center. And this narrower spot is what's used to do the imaging and get the resolution. But the problem is, is the intensities required for that depletion or the intensities required to excite that little bit that's left over are up to a gigawatt per square centimeter. Well, the sun outside on a sunny day is a tenth of a watt per square centimeter. So these techniques use anywhere from 10,000 to 10, 10 billion times as much light. And there's very little discussion in the literature about the phototoxic effects of doing this. Um, so I think that's frankly absurd. Um, in my opinion, this Nobel Prize was really premature, is that um, they haven't, the field hasn't settled itself out yet, and we haven't figured out what works, what doesn't, and really hit a few good home runs with the technique at this point. Um, so the, and the other problem is that they require extremely long acquisition times, because you have to create images that create so many pixels or voxels, that takes time. So there's a third, or actually fourth, if you can consider near field method of super resolution called structured illumination, where instead of illuminating the sample uniformly, you use a standing wave to create a grading pattern. And that grading pattern beats against the spatial frequencies of information in the sample in the same way the two screens on top of one another create more ray fringes to make them at lower frequency, which are detectable in the microscope. So it's limited to a factor of two resolution gain because the, the pattern itself is diffraction limited. And that's the reason the committee cited for not having SIM considered for this prize. But on the other hand, in my opinion, this weakness is its strength because A, you don't need to have such extreme labeling densities as you need with other methods, so it's much more compatible with existing labeling technology. But B, it requires far lower intensities, and C, it is far faster. So it's the one super resolution technique which is truly live cell compatible. So the guy who understood this sooner than any of the rest of us was the pioneer of SIM, Mats Gustafsson. He developed it first at UCSF, and then we were able to recruit him to Janili in 2008. But in 2009, he was diagnosed of a brain tumor, and in 2011, he died of that. And so I ended up basically inheriting Mats' SIM effort, his technology, his 
microscopes and his people. And so if Mots is the Messiah of Sim, I am his acolyte and spreading the gospel of Sim. I very much believe in localization, and localization is pretty much, in my opinion, the only go-to tool for protein-specific imaging below 50 nanometers. But in this 100 nanometer-ish range, there's nothing to beat SIM for doing live imaging. This is an example where we're looking at the endoplasmic reticulum at 100 nanometer resolution, but now we're looking at sub-second frame rates for thousands of time points. There's no other method at that resolution that could even touch that. And you start to see that, yes, the resolution's limited to a factor of two, but at the same time, look at the wealth of information you get in the temporal domain by being able to use that technique, which will be impossible with the other methods. Here's another example where we're looking at a T-cell analog that's plopped down against an antigen-presenting cover slip, and you can see the flow of actin as that immunological synapse is, is created. So we've, if the knock against SIM has been that its resolution has been limited to 100 nanometers, how can we improve upon that? Well, the simple and stupid thing to do is just to increase the numerical aperture of the lens. So Olympus sells a lens at 1.7 NA, which takes us down to 82 nanometer resolution, even with linear SIM. And so you can see here, if we're looking at these clathrin-coated pits, which are formed to, cr to pull cargos in past the plasma membrane inside of the cell, you can see that now these blobs that we saw now are resolved at rings because we're operating in total internal reflection, so we're only illuminating the top part of this, of this basket, of this clathrin basket. But now that we can actually measure the diameters of the clathrin coated pits, and that now that we can actually follow them for long periods of time, we can actually study the relationships between size and lifetime and, and growth of clathrin coated pits over time. So here's an example where we show the maximum size peaks out about 160. There's a weak correlation between the lifetime and the diameters of these pits. There's also quite a bit of controversy about the role of actin in clathrin-mediated endocytosis. Well, another of the major advantages of SIM is that unlike STED and POM, it doesn't require specialized labels, so it's very easy to do multicolor imaging. So here's an example of looking at actin and, and, and clathrin. And you can see we see individual pits as rings, we see clusters, which are these plaques that look like big fuzzy blobs at the diffraction limit, which in our case resolve into nothing more than clusters of rings which spit out individual guys periodically. Um, we found that actin is recruited right before endocytosis about half the time, and, it, and when it does, it has a small but statistically significant effect on shortening the lifetime. We also found quite a few examples of these rings of actin and citoclathrin, and we thought, oh, well, that must be co-localized with the clathrin and helping in endocytosis. But it turns out that almost none of them are co-localized. And there's not a lot of discussion in the EM literature about these, so we're not really quite sure what their role is. So um, if um, that technique got us to 80 nanometers, but if we want to go even higher, then we need to exploit these same photoswitching techniques that are the basis of STED and POM. And um, Mats was working on this when he died, and so the idea is to do something very similar to what Stefan Hell calls resolved. So in resolved, instead of, instead of exciting and then using stimulated emission to deactivate, you, you activate a photoswitchable molecule so all of them get turned on, and then you turn off all of them except in the node of his donut beam. In Mats's case, what you do is you put on a standing wave to deactivate all of the molecules except at the nodes of the standing wave, so you're left with these little skinny guys of remaining molecules that have high spatial frequency content to demodulate even higher spatial frequencies and go beyond that 2x limit. So in 2011, his grad student Hesper was able to push that then to get 50 nanometer resolution by that approach. The bugaboo was it took 900 seconds to get an image. And so as I and my postdoc Dong Lee started thinking about this, we realized that this depletion principle that's the basis of STED, resolved, and this form of nonlinear SIM is a really bad way to do live imaging because there's two problems. First is that 
most of the time you're taking all of your molecules up to an active state and then immediately bringing them back down. There's always a chance that they'll be lost to bleaching during that process. And the vast majority are contributing nothing to the image, just going on off and that's it. Um, the other problem is to deactivate them takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of light thrown at the cell, neither of which is conducive to live imaging. So we wanted to come up with an alternative approach to nonlinear SIM. And so the idea is very simple, is instead of uniformly activating the molecules, we turn on a standing wave of 405 activation light, which turns on a standing wave subpopulation of molecules, and we read those out with a 488 standing wave of light of the same period and phase. So now we have, instead of having two, one harmonic, which gets us to twice beyond the diffraction limit, we have two harmonics, which gets us to 60 nanometer resolution. So that's pretty damn good. Um, and this is an example showing the act inside a skeleton as we go from linear to nonlinear sim here, right? And then finally, then we can actually start to study the dynamics live at 60 nanometer resolution. So to give an idea of how good this resolution is, this is some of the best imaging of actin I've seen by Xiaowei Zhang's group. Um, this is um, looking uh, at a cell here. This is a fixed cell. This is live cell in our case here. But there's really not a heck of a lot of difference that we can see either in Fourier or real space between these two. And yet, um, this was a fixed cell. Here we could look for 34 time points. It took 600 times less to get um, this data. The intensity was 20 times lower. This is reported at 20 nanometer resolution. This has a theoretical limit of 62 nanometer resolution. So um, if people have believed up till now that SIM doesn't be deserve to be thought of in the same breadth as localization microscopy, STED, and Resolved, I'm here to tell you that's wrong, okay? So here's another example of live imaging, in this case looking at a different form of endocytosis through caviole. So this is looking at caviolin again, comparing turf resolution to uh, linear SIM and nonlinear SIM. And if you look in the EM record at caviole, they have a very stereotypical size of around 60 to 80 nanometers. We certainly see plenty of those in our data, but we see much greater variability than, than is reported in the EM literature. But then again, they don't have caviolin-specific contrast, so they may be missing or misinterpreting some of these bigger structures. So we can compare this then to the Resolve method that Stefan developed as a low power, more live cell compatible successor to STET. So this is an example they published last year doing live imaging of caviole. This is diffraction limited imaging in our case. This is the linear SIM and this is the nonlinear SIM. So again, we got 20 time points versus one, 200 times faster acquisition, 20 times less light. Yet clearly, despite the reported resolution, the resolution here is quite a bit better. Um, so that's also a general problem I have with the field when I talk about signal noise going to zero. The metrics that have been used to, to claim resolution in this business, in my opinion, are really weak. Um, and they're really not general enough to say what's happening across most of your field. They kind of cherry pick um, a particular spot. And, um, and so uh, I think uh, at this point, if you certainly with localization and the right labeling, you can push down to pretty much the molecular level now. But, um, but in most cases for live imaging or even fixed imaging, the nonlinear SIM can outperform just about any other method. So the moral of the story is that from going from most of the field was pushing towards just this metric and just thinking about this metric alone. But if spatial resolution were all that mattered, we could have stopped a long time ago when we had the EM. So other things matter too, phototoxicity, temporal resolution, imaging depth. Mott's understood that by going in the opposite direction, he had a space all to himself for a while where he could find all sorts of applications that were uh, not possible with the higher resolution methods, yet still uncover a lot of biology. So I took that to heart, and so in 2008, when I was looking for a new challenge, I said, well, what if we get away from super resolution altogether and go back to the diffraction limit? Is there a way we can make a microscope that would be as transformative for understanding the dynamics of cells in 3D in terms of its temporal resolution 
as palm was transformative in the spatial dimension. And so I made that my goal. So why is this important? Well, the hallmark of life is, is that it's animate, and every living thing is a complex thermodynamic pocket of reduced entropy. And so while structural imaging will always be important, the only way we're really going to understand this connection between inanimate molecules and the animate cell is to image the cell at high spatiotemporal resolution across all four dimensions of space-time. The good news is that the conventional tools used for live imaging leave a lot of room for improvement. They're basically the wide field microscope and the confocal microscope. But they illuminate the entire thickness of the specimen with light, even though only the focal plane has high resolution information. And so, in my opinion, one of the most important advances in microscopy in the last 15 years was when Ernst Stelzer at the EMBL reintroduced the 100-year-old idea of plane illumination. So instead of bringing the light through the same objective you collect with, you use a cylindrical lens, for example, from the side to create a sheet of light that illuminates only in the vicinity of the focal plane. There's then no bleaching, no toxicity of the regions above and below, no background from there. And because you illuminate the whole plane at once, you can, in a parallel way, collect your entire image from that plane very rapidly and then move plane by plane through the specimen. This has been transformative for studying embryogenesis in 3D at single cell resolution. But it has a problem for doing subcellular imaging, and that's that there's a trade-off between the thickness of the light sheet and how flat it is over a given field of view. And over the dimensions of a cell, it's typically about three microns thick, which is about half the thickness of a cultured cell, so you don't gain much benefit. So we thought of using a Bessel beam, which is a way of decoupling the length of the beam from its cross-section in a pencil of light, which we could then sweep in and out of the screen that you see here while we integrate on the camera, and then move to the next plane through the cell and the next and the next. So that was fine, but there was a problem in that a Bessel beam isn't just a pencil in cross-section, but it looks like a bullseye with a bunch of side lobes around it. And as you move that across, it creates some out of focus excitation and bleaching. And so one solution we came up with is instead of sweeping it continuously was to step it discreetly. And this would create a grading of excitation after which we could use Matz's methods of super resolution with SIM in order to make lemonade out of our lemons and actually use the side lobe information to give us resolution extension beyond the diffraction limit in both the axial direction and the sweeping direction. This is an example of that where we're looking at a cell that's been transfected with a cancer signaling protein that promotes these membrane ruffles that fold over and create those vacuoles that you see underneath. In order to make that work fast enough, we needed to create a, an array of seven parallel Bessel beams. And that made it fast, but what was shocking was how much less phototoxic it was to run with seven beams instead of one. And what I've learned in six years of doing live imaging is that while the total dose of light you throw on the cell is important, a far more important metric is the instantaneous power delivered at the cell. So seen in this light, a confocal microscope may be the absolute stupidest possible way to do live imaging. Because not only do you have these cones of light above and below the focus that's doing all this bleaching, at the focus itself, you have an actinic spot of light that's driving around and leaving death and destruction behind it. And so the moral of the story is a line is better than a point and a plane is better than a line. So why stop at seven beams? So I started to model what would happen if the beams became so tightly packed that the side lobes actually started to constructively interfere. And what happens is you go through these crazy resonances and anti-resonances of constructive and destructive interference but at certain magic periods of the pattern, you get near destructive interference of the side lobes. You get 100% modulation in the plane, which is ideal for doing structured illumination. And you spread the energy out across the entire plane to reduce the peak power even further. So it's a triple win. As an engineer, triple wins come across as commonly as unicorns. So when you find one, you embrace it. And so this then became what we call today the lattice light sheet microscope. So this is some examples of using it for single cell imaging. This example is looking at a field of dividing cells in three different colors. So you're looking at histones to mark the chromosomes. You're looking at the mitochondria, and you're looking at the ER. And now we're taking that data set and cutting it in two micron thick slabs 
as these cells divide. And this is an expanded view of this particular slab. You can see that during mitosis, the, the ER forms these little pockets, and then the, um, uh, um, the mitos fragment into little pieces that fit in those pockets and are carried along as the cell divides. Um, if any of you look at mitotic cells, you'll know that they're very light sensitive because they have all sorts of checkpoints to shut down if they're stressed. But here we were taking 300 volumes in each of three different colors. This represented almost a half a million 2D images distilled into this 5D data set that you see here, and yet all the cells divided perfectly happily. Here's another light sensitive organism, Dictostelia, the slime old amoeboid. And here we're looking at an actin-related protein. You see that crazy-looking lightning bolt there. So that was a bit of a surprise. But you know, I'm really, I'm really proud to have been part of the development of Palm, and I do believe it's an important tool. But I furthermore believe, based on the response of the 50-odd collaborators we've had to come to use the lattice scope already, that this will be the most important tool I'll make in my career. It seems like every week we have a new adventure with a new group of people, and everybody goes away in a week with 10 terabytes of data that they don't know what to do with. So, um, And then here we're looking at tetrahymena, the protozoan trapped in the pocket of agarose, twisting its way to find a way out of that jail. If you like these videos, um, we have an album, a Vimeo album. If you just Google lattice light sheet Vimeo, you'll see like 40 examples of things like this. So next level up is cell-cell interactions. So here with Jillian Griffith's group and Jennifer Lippincott-Schwartz, we're looking at T cells actually in, uh, uh, attaching onto dendritic cells and forming the immunological synapse. And so you can see as the cell attaches and shortens up as the uropod goes in, there's also a clearing of the actin from the center here. And at the same time, once it's established, there's a very fast flow of actin away from the synapse there. Much of what we know from, um, about cell motility is by looking at cells on cover slips, but here we're looking at a cell now looking through, working in 3D through a collagen mesh, this is with Dyke Mullen's group at UCSF. And then at the largest scale, you can try to look at embryos. Early C. elegans, you can see the whole embryo. For Salfala, you can see the surface of the embryo or a little bit deep. So in this case, we're looking at a protein AR2, which leaves a mid-body remnant that you saw there, and you'll see again like that. And our collaborator, Josh Bembenek, thinks that remnant has a later role in, in development. In this case, halfway through embryogenesis in the Drosophila embryo, the epithelium comes up and around and closes around these earlier amniocerosis cells in this purse string structure here. And there's these act pulsing actin uh, contractions and expansions here. And we were able to show that uh, because we can look at both the apical and basal surfaces of these cells, that these are anti-correlate. And finally, um, the light sheet has brought us full circle back to single molecule work. So this is with the Transcription Imaging Consortium that Maxine mentioned, and uh, particularly James Liu. This is looking at now not a, one of the big I guess skeletons in the closet of the single molecule business is usually your samples have to be quite thin because otherwise the out-of-focus molecules obscure your ability to see the other ones. But this is looking at a 35 micron spheroid of mouse embryonic stem cells. In wide field you got no prayer, but if you can park the light sheet at one plane, the light sheet is thinner than the depth of focus of your high NA detection objective. So only molecules that are in focus are illuminated, so you get turf type signal noise now anywhere inside of a multicellular system. And this has been used in experiments similar to what Maxime discussed in terms of looking at specific and non-specific binding of transcription factors to DNA. So again, th that actually brought me back to localization microscopy because in the same year that, um, that uh, we developed Palm, um, uh, Robin Hochstrasser at Penn developed a related technique which doesn't use photoactivation but the transient binding of molecules whizzing in solution to their targets. Remember the big challenge of all super resolution is getting enough density of label. But if the entire medium is labeled, if you just wait long enough, you're going to get more and more guys coming and binding on. 
And the problem with pain is because the whole media is labeled, you have that signal noise problem because now you got a thick specimen. So paint and lattice is a marriage made in heaven. Here's an example looking at intracellular membranes um, in an interface cell, and here we're looking in a, in a dividing cell. Um, so all of that's good if you're patient enough in order to do it, but it takes a damn long time. This here is half a billion localizations, so that's typically two orders of magnitude than in a typical localization image, and it takes proportionally longer. This was like six days of continuous imaging in a microscope to get there. So I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll skip ahead, but one final area we're working on is adaptive optics, because um, what I want to do is I want to take cell biology away from the cover slip, and I want to see the cell on its own terms. I, you know, now that we have genome editing to look at endogenous levels of proteins, now that we have lattice light sheet to keep it non-invasive, the last part of the puzzle is to watch cells in the environment in which they evolved. And in order to do that, we have to deal with the refractive index variations and the aberrations they cause. So this is looking over a large area of a zebrafish brain and a sparse subset of neurons. If we turn off the adaptive optics, that's what you would see with a conventional two-photon microscope. And then you turn on the adaptive optics and you get back to recovering the diffraction. So we're working now to try to combine all of these tools so that we can basically take cell biology and, and put it in the context of whole organisms, first at the diffraction limit and then ultimately beyond with super resolution. And so uh, last thing to say is, is um, if any of you are interested in any of the tools that I've described here, and there are others, there's a very fast good system for single molecule uh, tracking uh, Motz's multifocal microscope. Harold has a terrific 3D palm system called the iPalm. We also have the lattice scope, the SIM scope, as part of our advanced imaging center at Genelia. There's the website. If you want to try any of these tools, it's a two-page proposal, very low pain. If you're accepted, you come out for at least a week or two. We put you up in the hotel, we give you meal tickets for the pub and so forth, and it's a good time, but you'll work really hard and you'll get a lot of data. And it's a lot of fun, and it will tell you if you want to invest further in these tools after that. So with that, um, there's way too many people to thank, but you know, we're 50-odd collaborators at this point. Many of my, of my um, colleagues at Janelia, Harold, of course, who, without Harold, I wouldn't have a Nobel Prize, and he deserves it just as much as I do. And then finally, uh, my group. I've averaged about three people in my group over the eight years I've been at Janelia, and so everything you've seen is from that many people. And it's because they all work really hard. So thank you for your time. Thank you.